Watson. I'm the Exhibitions Coordinator at the Library of Virginia, and what we just put up on Transcribe has a lot to do with our upcoming exhibition. We demand Women's Suffrage in Virginia opens on January 13th of 2020. That's just a few months <laughs> away from now, which is scary. Um, and we'll be up throughout uh, 2020. And what happened in 2020? Who can tell me? Close. Ni ratification of the 19th Amendment. That's right. So we're going to do a little celebration. And part of that was scanning the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia papers. And Mary's going to walk you through a little bit of that. And then I'll come back and tell you about that there is more to come. <laughs> Alrighty, so yes, we are very excited to have a new collection in Transcribe, and I've seen some of you working on it. Um, <laughs> so in addition to our exhibition in 2020, we'll also have a book coming out, um, the Campaign for Women's Suffrage in Virginia. And the Equal Suffrage League records that we have here really made it possible to, to do those. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, they, uh, and I actually, I want to say thank you to a few people um, who made the digitization and the transcribing possible. Um, Trenton Heiser and Jesse Bennett and Kathy Jordan and Sonia Coleman all here at the library helped get the collection ready for scanning and getting it into transcribe. So thank you to all of them. Um, and the campaign for women's suffrage lasted a long time um, from the 19th century into the 20th century and in Virginia even we had a couple short-lived suffrage organizations in the 1870s and the 1890s but this collection of the Equal Suffrage League records um, is for an organization that was started here in Richmond in 1909 by a small group of socially prominent women um, there were some artists there were some writers or social reformers, uh, they, all, they all wanted the vote, some for different reasons, some wanted the vote because they knew that having the vote would help them pass legislation to reform child labor laws or um, to uh, support women's education. I know some of you are also transcribing the Mary Mumford papers. She was a member of the Equal Suffrage League and in part because she knew that having the votes would increase her chances of um, establishing a coordinate college for women at the University of Virginia, which unfortunately did not work, but um, but anyway, but that's why she supported women's suffrage. And others, we have uh, best-selling novelist Mary Johnston. She <laughs> talked about how she paid her fair share of taxes and therefore she should have the right to vote, which should be a familiar argument to many people. Um, and so over the course of the decade, the 1910s, these women built up a statewide organization. It had 20,000 members and almost 150 chapters at different times around the state. So without having these Equal Suffrage League records, we really wouldn't know a whole lot about that. So it's really exciting to, to have them online and they'll be easy to search. Um, there are some limits to the records. The Equal Suffrage League was an organization only for white women. Um, the women, and well, and men, some men also joined it, but the women who founded it were not advocating necessarily for African American women to be able to vote. And you will see there's um, documents in the collection that will reflect the attitudes of the anti-suffragists who argued that um, African-American women voting would threaten white political control of the state and suffragists to kind of tried to sweep it under the rug and say that's not a problem. Virginia already controls who can vote. Uh, so we can, so black women won't be a threat. Um, but so these records definitely tell the story from a certain perspective. But, um, but they are very valuable to helping tell the story. And from doing research in these, we've learned that the women's suffrage movement in Virginia was not quite the failure it has been made out to be. The General Assembly did defeat proposals to amend the state constitution, and the General Assembly did not ratify the amendment in 1920. 
but um, in 1920, they did vote to ratify this, or they did vote to propose an amendment to the state constitution to allow women to vote. So they had finally caught on to the fact that women in Virginia did want to vote. And also they, um, that same year, before the amendment was ratified, they, they equal suffrage league convinced the assembly to pass a bill that would allow them to register after the deadline if the amendment was ratified before the 1920 election, which it was. So they did have some success. And let me see if I can remember how to. So there are 31 boxes of records of the Equal Suffrage League, and they got to the library pretty much thanks to the work of one woman, Ida Mae Thompson. She had been the headquarters secretary of the Equal Suffrage League, and she kept a lot of the office records herself. Um, but in the 1930s, she worked for the Historical Records Survey, uh, which was a WPA project um, during the Great Depression that did what its name says. They made surveys of where records were um, around Virginia. And so she took this opportunity to write women all over the state who had been involved with the suffrage movement and asked them to send her any documents or recollections they had related to uh, their suffrage work. Now there are some women who replied, like Janetta Fitzhugh did. She had been president of the Equal Suffrage League in Fredericksburg, and she wrote that, I kept many such things as you asked for, but finally being pressed for room to retain such matter destroyed them all. Which makes me sad every time I, <laughs> all over again, every time I read it. But fortunately there were other women <laughs> who did keep things um, and provided them to Ida Mae Thompson, and then she donated them to the State Library. And one of the things that I think is pretty neat is that for a couple years, the Equal Suffrage League headquarters was located at 800 East Broad Street, which is where the library is now, so some of the records have come back to their original location, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, so what kind of stuff is in here? There is a lot of correspondence. Um, much of it is handwritten. And some of our suffragists have pretty decent handwriting. You can see on the left, that's pretty legible. And I know actually there was somebody back here who was transcribing some of Mrs. Ellie Putney's uh, letters. She was, wrote the letters that are on the, um, on the right. And her handwriting's a little more tricky, so it can be challenging. Um, but in addition to correspondence, there's meeting minutes, annual reports, state convention programs, financial records, news bulletins, pamphlets and brochures, pledge cards, records from local chapters, and all kinds of other office documents. Um, we did not digitize the entire collection. Some of the items are from national organizations like the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and then later on the National League of Women Voters and other groups and some of those, a lot of those materials are available in other sources. You can find like the National American Women Suffrage Association convention proceedings in Google Books. So we did not scan those kinds of materials because they're already available. Although if you want to look at them at the library, you can certainly come and do that. Um, so we concentrated pretty much on the records that are unique to the Equal Suffrage League. And I think Jesse said there's about 1,400 items so far in transcribed, but there'll be about 10,000 total scans. So, so there's a lot. Um, and like Sonia mentioned, there is a list of names because one of the things you'll notice in this collection is that married and widowed women are usually identified by their husband's name, which was common practice although that can make things more difficult for people who come along later searching for their grandmother or somebody and they search under the woman's name and not the husband's name. So we've created the list. Um, it is not exhaustive by any means, but it is some names that are fairly common in the collection. So hopefully that will help with things a little bit. Some women would fortunately use give both their names. In this case, Ida Mae Thompson 
wrote to Mrs. S. R. Brockenrow in Suffolk, um, and when she replied, fortunately she identified herself both as Mrs. Samuel R. Brockenrow and Chrissy Gill Brockenrow, so we know who she is. Other times we get lists like this. Um, Mrs. John H. Lewis, Mrs. H. C. McDowell, Mrs. R. T. Watts Jr. And in this case, we happen to know Mrs. John H. Lewis is Elizabeth Langhorne Lewis, who was an aunt of Nancy Astor, the first British, uh, the first woman in the um, British Parliament, and the treasurer of the Lynchburg League. And Mrs. Mrs. Dexter Udy is her daughter. Elizabeth Lewis Udy, and the picture is of the two of them on their way to a suffrage demonstration. Um, and we've done a lot of work on the two of them for our Dictionary of Virginia Biography project. We've been trying to document a number of the um, really active suffragists in, uh, in Virginia. So, but a lot of these others, I do, we do not have their names for at this point. Um, usually census records and city directories can help us figure it out, but it takes a little bit of time. So we're not asking transcribers to do it, <laughs> um, but hopefully we'll be able to get their names included. So there is a lot of correspondence in the collection. The league officers wrote each other, uh, they wrote to members of local leagues, and they also corresponded with other organizations. Uh, members from around the state would write in for advice or to request literature or to let the office know what they're up to. Um, some of the correspondents are very chatty in their letters, which can give us some nice details. Uh, they also talk about attitudes that they faced from people in their community. Uh, one of the letters is from Fanny King. She was president of the Equal Suffrage League in Stanton, and she described her family's response to her speech to a local labor group, I think it was about 1912 or 13, but she wrote afterwards that, quote, my male relatives and friends crossed the street or dodged into stores to keep from speaking to such a bold, bad woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's all kinds of fun stuff like that in there. Um, there are boxes containing information on the local leagues, for a lot of the leagues, what we have is the piece, the list that's on the left. Um, somebody at the Equal Suffrage League office created these for most of the leagues. Most of you probably can't see this one. This one's for the Glen Allen League in Henrico County here. And the first name on the list, she was the chairman, is Ms. Maud Trevette which I thought was cool because my daughter went to Montreal Elementary School, <laughs> which is you know, just up the road in Henrico County. So I was like, oh, look, I know who this is. <laughs> so anyway, um, so there's, so, so, but other leagues, we do have more information from, um, like in this, the two books on the left are from the Norfolk League and they have meeting minutes and, um, like at the one at the bottom is the list of members and when they paid their dues, which seemed to be a dollar a year. Um, we also have some printed things like pamphlets that the Equal Suffrage League produced, uh, things like um, advertisement for speeches, how the vote was won was a play that groups often performed as a fundraiser. In this case, this was one that um, they performed, the Richmond League performed at the Jefferson Hotel in 1914. And one of the interesting and unique items in this collection is an index card file that Equal Suffrage League members um, created when they were lobbying the General Assembly in 1919 and 1920 to ratify the 19th Amendment. Um, which Virginia got around to in 1952, just in case you're curious. Um, but they created these cards to document how the uh, legislators thought about voting rights for women. And we haven't really come across this in anything else. This might have been kind of an innovation in lobbying uh, at the General Assembly in the early 20th century. Um, 
the cards are not all this detailed. But in this case, we see that Wilbur Hall, who represented Fauquier and Loudoun counties, is described as opposing woman suffrage in 1918. But now, in 1919 or 20, he is considering voting yes. And Elizabeth Lewis and Adele Clark went to interview him, and he told them that he hoped the Equal Suffrage League would get a large petition in his county to show that his con constituents did really support woman suffrage and therefore he would be justified in voting for it. Um, so if you want to find out more about some of our suffragists, you can uh, read about them in the Dictionary of Virginia Biography. The URL is at the top. You can also use the little <coughs> search window on the um, library homepage and search for women suffrage activists and you'll come up with biographies. I mean, they weren't, a lot of these women did other things as well. We have um, nationally known writers, women, we have business entrepreneurs, the pin money pickle lady who was one of our suffrage officers. Um, but anyway, this is just kind of a quick look at the records. And Barbara is going to tell you about. But wait! Some more. <laughs> There'll be more to transcribe. <laughs> There's another group of women who were suffragists in Virginia, uh, not just the Equal Suffrage League of Virginia. In June of 1915, several members of the ESL got a little tired of being persuasive and polite and proper women. And so they joined with the Congressional Union Party which was the National Party founded by um, Alice Paul, which is now the National Woman's Party. This is the group that went to Washington that picketed the White House. This is the group that was arrested several times and spent time in prison. Uh, Pauline Adams, who was the ESL member from Norfolk and then joined the Congressional Union Party, uh, we have her papers and we have her letters from the prison, which I don't know if those are up. They're not in transcribed. Oh, we'll have to work on that. <laughs> um, so not a whole lot of letters, but they're really interesting because she goes into solitary at one point. So what we have and what will go up on transcribe a little bit later this year are the minute books for the Congressional Union Party, uh, the Virginia branch, uh, formed here in June of 1915. Um, the founder was Sophie Meredith, and we have the minute book um, uh, courtesy of Sophie's great-granddaughter, um, and we also have a number of speeches and notes for speeches that Sophie made uh, throughout the rest of her life. She was quite a reformer. So those will be um, digitized and also transcribed just to give the other side of the story. Um, and I'll tell you that the banner you see votes for women. Yes, that will be in the show. <laughs> also, the We Demand an Amendment to the U.S. Constitution will be in the show. We have four banners. They're awesome. So this is just a draft of the, uh, on, the le on your yeah, left, um, is the draft of the logo. The exhibition is We Demand Women's, it is going to be Women's Suffrage in Virginia, um, opens on January 13th and runs through December 5th of 2020. So I hope you'll come and see, I hope you'll jump online and help us transcribe this really, these two really important collections of papers. Thanks. Do you have any does anybody have any questions or anything? Be happy to answer. And if you want to know if we have the Adele Clark papers, no, those are at VCU. So talk to Ray <laughs> Bonus so they can get those digitized and transcribed.